trust is about connection. That's what we're talking about today. Today we're in our sixth of seven parts to spiritual leadership, and we're talking about really solidifying trust. How do we solidify trust? There's a story told on the internet, actually the, the man who posted it, or, or the byline, is uh, Raul Sinha. And he talks about how this businessman is on a plane, and many of you maybe can relate to this if you've flown before and ever experienced turbulence. So, oh, I hear the, oh, <laughs> the room. So he's, um, he's on one of those planes where the pilot comes over and says, you know, fasten your seatbelts, we might get into a little turbulence. And then there's a, you know, a little bit of a pause, and then it's another announcement, we're not going to be having beverage service because of the turbulence. And then there's a little pause, and we're not going to have a meal service, which I'm guessing is an international uh, flight. Because <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's these announcements, right? So there's, there's sort of a ramping up of the anxiety on the plane. And the man is just noticing this. So he's noticing it in himself after the third announcement, but he's also looking around seeing a lot of people begin to pray as they get into the turbulence. Pretty soon the plane is being tossed around like a toy, there's lightning outside, there's thunder, there's, you know, there's, there's real feeling of, of uh, fear in the plane. And he's amazed, this man, as he's looking around and he's, you know, now hearing people, you know, talk out their fears or scream out their fears or say their prayers out loud and, you know, this kind of thing. He notices there's this one little girl and she is as calm as can be and she's reading a book and she's acting like nothing is going on. He said her, her feet are sort of tucked under her, how she's sitting that very comfortable sort of sideways sit and she's just reading and he said occasionally she'll close her eyes as if she's contemplating what she's reading, and then she'll go back down and she'll continue to read. Once in a while she'll stretch out her legs in front of her. And everyone around her is freaking out, right? <laughs> so he's really intrigued. What's going on with this little girl? Why is she so calm? They finally get out of the turbulence and they safely land, and he really wants to talk to her. He notices, too, that everybody else is getting off the plane like people do, you know, the mad rush to grab your bags and get in line and, and get to the next thing. And, and she's just sitting there ever so calmly. So he thinks, well, I'm going to wait and talk to this girl because I need to find out what was going on there. And so he goes up to her and he says, you know, I noticed there was a big storm, there was lots of turbulence, and everybody was really fearful, but you were so calm. What was going on for you? What were you thinking? And she says, oh, sir, the thing is, the pilot is my father, and he's taking me home. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, when we know that, when we know who's in charge of our lives and that they're taking us home, there's nothing to fear. There's no freak out. There's no anxiety. If only all across our world and our country, we could give that gift right now, right? That we could all just get that for a moment, just drop into that, just be that little girl that just knows, yeah, this is, this is divine order at work <laughs> in the midst of turbulence, in the midst of chaos, all is well. I'm being piloted home. And we are always the co-pilot, you know, so we're not left out of the equation. This isn't the, you know, we don't belong to the, the separation belief around um, spirituality, but that we are one with this spirit. We are one with this divine entity. And so that's where this trust work gets really important because it's our part. What is our part in this? How do we participate? How do we co-pilot through, through life so that that, so that we can get to where we're going in a safe and a calm way and, and a joyful way and a passionate way, whatever it is that we're up to in our lives. So trust is a funny thing, you know, for us humans because we, we often believe that we are trustworthy, but we don't really trust other people fully, you know? So there's this whole dynamic where we're all walking around thinking, what? What? I am so trustworthy. You know, we really believe ourselves to be, but we're often a little bit slower to trust the people around us because they have to kind of prove it, right? Show us over time with experience that we can trust whatever it is um, that this individual may or may not do. 
So there's a trusting others. There's, of course, the trusting spirit that we always come back to because that's our grounding, that's our foundation, that's our knowing, that faith that we are always taken care of, that we are always walking toward home, even though it may look like we've taken a detour. That, and that that home is the, the deepest place within us and trusting that, and trusting ourselves to follow that, to know that, to, to, to be that. So, um, so you, you, have you ever had anybody tell you, you just gotta trust me on this? You know, and, and maybe you don't even really know the person, right? It's somebody who you're buying something from or whatever, and they're, you just got to trust me on this one, you know? And you're thinking, well, I don't know. You know, it's not how trust really works. It doesn't work like by demand. It works, it works by showing it, right? It works by, by our actions and, and our words lining up with our actions. So Brene Brown, who we've been drawing from here and there throughout our series and spiritual leadership, we've been drawing some from her latest work, Dare to Lead. And in, in this book, as well as a previous book, she uses this braving inventory. It's an assessment tool, and it's also um, an, an ability for us to kind of see how trust breaks down into all these different actionable spaces and ways of being and qualities, elements of trust, essentially. So we're going to take a look at those today, one by one. And the first one, well, let me just walk you through what they are. So it's BRAVING, the acronym BRAVING, and B is for boundaries, R is for reliability, A is for accountability, V is for vault, another way of understanding confidentiality, I is for integrity, N is for non-judgment or being non-judgmental, and G is for generosity. Now, I see some of you writing quickly, and so um, one place you can get this is at BreneBrown.com, or you could probably just Google Braving Inventory, but if you go to BreneBrown.com, there's a ton of resources there and lots of different things to download, and you can download the handout that has not only the acronym but, but shorthand for each one, an explanation for each one of those. Um, from her perspective. Today, we're looking at that perspective, but we're also looking at, at from that place of, as spiritual beings on this spiritual journey, how does, it, how does it tie back to that? How does each one of those tie back to our spiritual walk as well? So, you know, the first one, B, is for boundaries. And this one often un misunderstood, really, because we think of boundaries, we think of them in a healthy way, but we also sometimes, you know, feel a little pushback against boundaries. And especially, you know, I think our unity culture is very, um, everything goes kind of thing, right? <laughs> so part of our beauty of being such a non-judgmental place, we really get the end down, is that sometimes it, it may seem like there, there really are no guidelines or there really are no boundaries, but indeed there are. <laughs> and we need them, right? We need them in life. It's like the, the river needs the boundaries of the banks to know where to go. The fish then need the boundary of the river to know where to go. You know, all of us need that. The, the hiker needs the boundary of the path to have a sense of, of how to follow along next to the river, you know, that we all need that. We need that sense of guidelines. And so boundaries are basically, the way that Brene describes it, is, is being clear about what's okay and what's not okay for you, for the organization, for the family, for the group, whatever it is, and, and communicating that. And so here's where it gets a little messy, is sometimes we think that's not kind. But the truth is, clear is kind. And unclear is unkind. Sometimes super loosey-goosey like anything goes isn't very kind because nobody really knows what's expected or, or how to, you know, kind of navigate. And so I think that's really how we got our five basic principles is because unity was like it's so amorphous for people that we finally had somebody finally said, okay, well, here's some basic ideas. And then we all went, oh, yes, because <laughs> we need those guidelines, right? We need a sense of kind of a, a path. And so boundaries offer that to us, to one another. And, and it's really helpful to know what somebody else's boundaries are, which might be different than yours. For example, you might be a big hugger. Somebody else might not be. It's true, somebody in this room may not like to hug. <laughs> I know, right? Probably more than one, probably many. So we just had to follow the cues, right? Is a hand coming out toward us or are wide open arms coming toward us, you know? And to know and to, to respect that. It's a difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule, right? The golden rule 
<laughs> the golden rule is I, I will treat others as I wish to be treated. The platinum rule is I will treat others the way they wish to be treated. And so how will we know unless we ask or follow the cues? That's all part of that boundary. So all of that then builds trust, right? Now I trust that you won't get in my physical space because you're following my cue or you're, you're appreciating what I've asked for. Or what I've said is a boundary for me. So whatever that is from that simple kind of act to something much bigger, boundaries help us. They're like the laws of the universe. You know, the, the laws of the universe, like the law of circulation, as we give, so we receive. So we work that law and it works every time. It's like it gives us that sense of trust. We can trust in this. We can have faith that this will always work. Or laws of science. We can trust that gravity will always keep us close to the earth. And, and so on the other hand, we can trust that when we're you know, trying to jump off a roof and fly, that we're gonna need some kind of apparatus to support us, right? We're gonna have to hang glide or something. We're gonna have to have something that helps us to, to defy that law so that we can experience something different. And so it's always kind of keeping within those principles and those laws and working them. You know, the saying in New Thought is, it works if I work it. The principle always works. It's always working. If we work it, then it works in our lives. Like the law of attraction is another one. Like, like thoughts and feelings will attract like experiences, right? So where we focus is where we attract. So all of that is really a part of sort of the setting of boundaries that all that gives us these, these guidelines and these principles and these laws that really help us. So when we look at that in terms of an organization or a family or a team, it's like having group agreements. You know, when you have group agreements or family rituals or ways of being that just everybody, they, like, you know, kids really love that. They can really count on that. So do the kids in us. And that's where the kindness comes in. That's where the clarity and kindness comes in. So if nothing else, just remember that, that clear is kind. And so having some clarity around boundaries is something that it, it gives us a sense of trust in one another. The second one is reliability. In short form for reliability to me is follow, follow through. You know, if you ever play a sport, and, and pretty much all the sports, the, the racket sports like um, tennis and racquetball and um, golf and basketball and baseball and, uh, you know, really kind of all of them, softball, they follow through is key, right? You can't really have a good shot if you don't follow through. Um, so if you've ever played any of those things or watched those things, if you've been watching the Warriors lately and you, and you, know, you, you watch a, a real bomb of a shot, you'll you probably notice that there wasn't follow through. You know, or you watch a free throw and if there's follow through, a lot of times that's really key. So sometimes we stop short of, of what it is that we've said we're going to do or we're intending to do. And, and that reliability piece then, then is, is difficult for people to grab onto. So the reliability aspect of, of uh, trust is, is that piece of follow through for one another. But it's also in terms of, of relying on our innate guidance, right? We always have what we need right here within us. We always have that, that guidance available to us, that innate core of wisdom available to us. The more we rely on it, the more we go into it, the more we practice it, the easier it is to call it up in any given moment. And so relying on spirit to guide us and then to do what we're guided to do, that's the follow through piece, right? So a lot of times we'll get guidance and then we'll go, yeah, I don't think so, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to, or I'm not sure about that, and so we'll hold on to it, and then it'll come again. Or on the flip side, we might have experiences where we didn't follow our guidance and things don't turn out so well. Anybody ever have one of those? Yeah, I have a, a minister friend who um, said he, he had a um, disruptive individual in a leadership position in his church who was trying to create a lot of separation and division within the church and a lot of drama and so on. And, you know, he did what we do, you know, sat down and talked, tried to work things through, did, you know, and, and then that person uh, stepped out of a leadership role and then later there was an opportunity to come back into it 
and his gut instinct said no. But his, his sort of idea of generosity or kindness or second chance said yes, and he overruled his guidance, right, from this sort of more intellectual desire for, for what he really wanted to have happened. And so more chaos was, you know, reigned in the church and more problems reigned and there was a lot of instability, which upsets, it's not just, a, you know, it wasn't just about his journey, of course, it's about the whole community, right? So the whole community and this, this big uproar and upset. So then this person leaves and everything, you know, begins to settle down and they kind of get their rhythm and then it happens a third time. So he's kind of beating himself up for not following his guidance. He ended up quitting that community and, you know, then there's all kinds of repair work that needs to happen. So it can be big stuff, you know, when we are in leadership positions and we don't follow that spiritual guidance. And I don't mean just formal leadership positions because it's really all of us in this room that are on this spiritual journey have all these ways that we show up as, as power and powerful, potent influences in our families and our circles of friends because we have a way of being and seeing and thinking that some other people may not have and it's a new perspective to bring, right? To, to lead in that way that relies on innate guidance. And I mean, it's, in some circles it might not feel comfortable to share all that, but you don't have to share all that, right? It can just be what you trust within yourself that, that you know kind of which direction you need to go or what you need to say or what your gut is telling you no or yes <laughs> and that can be the thing that we rely on so reliability is a big part of that of of relying on on the guidance that we receive and then the key following through with the guidance we receive doing the thing that we're, we were being told to do or not do the a is accountability Accountability is another word for responsibility, but allowing ourselves to be accountable, right, to our actions and our words. There's a man who didn't want to be accountable, and so the sign on his desk said, um, the buck actually passes, <laughs> but does not stop here. This is just engraved right there, you know. <laughs> And so it might be true in a hierarchical organization, there might be some truth to what he's saying is that like, I'm the middle guy, so it doesn't actually stop here. But that's not really the way of solidifying trust, is it? <laughs> we wanna know that the buck stops with us, always that we take responsibility for what is ours to be, to do. And that when we make mistakes, we just say, you know, oops, I made a mistake. I apologize and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to redo it. I'm going to make it up to you, whatever that is. That's being accountable. When you do that, then people trust you. People trust that you will make good on things when they go sideways and that you won't bring a lot of baggage and heavy energy into it, you know? And if we do bring a lot of baggage and heavy in energy into it, then hopefully we're in a culture where we'll unpack that so we can move on, right? So that's part of the courageous culture that we build too, the vulnerable places that we build where we can go to those places, not drown in them, not get dragged down in them, but to be able to at least touch on them, to recognize what's there and to free ourselves so we can move forward together. It's building both a culture of trust and showing up as a trustworthy individual. And then always grounded right here, right? On, on, on the truth right here within us. The V is for vault. It's a way of confidentiality, sort of locking in whatever is said to us in a, in a way that is not going to be repeated. Of course, there are occasional exceptions of things like mandatory reporting for abuse or somebody going to hurt themselves or something like that. But for the most part, that's really the exception. The confidentiality is about things really stopping here. You know, just like with spirit, where we can have God be like a best friend, where we have, you know, that kind of confessional space of prayer, where we can say whatever we want to say, we can kind of unload whatever we want to unload without any fear of judgment. And so we can also be that for others. We can be that kind of space for others where, where there's a listening space for people to share some things with us, maybe some difficult things for them. And we can hold that kind of, 
knowing that it's not going to go any further than this space, so people can trust that. And again, like anything else, the only way you can trust it is having practice over time or following your gut instinct, your knowing, your inner knower that says this is a safe place or eh, I don't think I'm going to share that right now. You know, and we just have to do that dance within ourselves and trust that process. So Brene Brown gives an example for the vault one where uh, somebody, uh, 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 there's a boss and an employee having a conversation. And um, the boss says, I have some concerns about confidentiality. And the employee says, I can't imagine what that would be. I mean, you've never told me anything that I've repeated. I've always keep the proprietary ideas for the company, you know, under a tight lid. And the boss says, yeah, but you often speak about and share things about others that aren't yours to share. And see, so it's not always about like somebody keeping our secret. It's that we see that they talk a lot <laughs> about other people's business. So we're not going to trust them with our information. So it's that like, kind of, you know, there's that kind of gossipy energy or what um, Brene talks about sort of pseudo connection. You know, oh, I got the inside scoop. And so we want to try to make a connection with somebody and be known as the one who's got the inside scoop. When actually when we do that, we're eroding trust. And so know that that kind of thing in a community can really break trust, but what can really build trust is when we are that kind of listening space where things don't get repeated. It's a tough thing in a spiritual community because we care about each other and there's a lot, you know, so finding the lines is really, can be really tough sometimes. But often it, the best thing is if somebody's, say, hurt or ill, is to just ask them, is this something you'd like us to share with the community? Is this something you'd like to share with the minister and the prayer chaplains? I think folks would love to know and support you. You know, so, so we try to do our best to, to know that and, and, to, sh and to share from, from that kind of place. And then the I is for integrity. And Brene describes integrity as choosing courage over comfort. So the times that we will choose courage over comfort, a lot of times it's about those tough conversations she talks about having, not avoiding the tough conversations. But you know, sometimes we avoid tough conversations or people will avoid them because there's a bigger dimension to that. Even the social aspect is hard, you know, for some people. So even the, so let alone having a tough conversation, just having that kind of bringing out of their shell and into a social environment is difficult. I was reading an online chat of some people that were talking about this and, and one person said, um, I hate to cancel. I know we made plans to get together tonight, but that was two hours ago and I was younger and more hopeful then. <laughs> Someone else says, I look at my phone until it stops ringing when somebody calls so then I can text them and ask them what they wanted. <laughs> yeah, if we find ourselves there maybe. Um, and then another one, whenever I send a risky text, I like to throw my phone down and run away and pretend nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see some of these behaviors give us a sense of how we like to avoid, right? When there is something, either e even social contact or even beyond that, to, to be able to, to come around to what needs to be talked about, that what needs to be, you know, built in so we can really be who we've come to be, so we can be the essence of who we've come to be. We'll always be called higher by spirit. We'll always be called into courage. We'll always be called. I mean, there will be like a, there's a constant energy of becoming, right? Because we're constantly falling away the things or dropping away the things, shedding the things that aren't the highest and best and taking on what is the highest and best. And that's that call of spirit that we answer to. And that's integrity. So if we stay in integrity with that and we rise to the occasion of which we are called, we will be doing the best and highest good. So a lot of, she also talks about how integrity is living into our values. So there's also, of course, that sense that we are lining up our values and our actions and our words with one another. 
So what we make or what we buy lines up with our values. The kinds of companies we do business with lines up with our values. We don't want to, to do business with somebody who seems to have eroded trust by doing something um, unethical. Instead, we want to do business with those who time and time again prove that they have a social consciousness that lines up with our own, that there's a sense of environmental sustainability that lines up with our own values, that there is a kindness to people, to animals, to children, whatever it is. So, so whatever those values are that are intrinsic to us, that becomes then our guide and integrity. And so following the line of integrity can, can really call up a lot of courage. It's the, the tough stuff, actually, that challenges us in our integrity. But boy, when we prove that, when we show that to ourselves and to others by taking this, the courageous step, our trust factor goes out the roof. You know, people really then can feel, oh, like the little girl on the plane, we can just relax, you know? That, that the, my teammates, my family members, my friends, my circle of friends, my community, they got this. My board of trustees, they got this. I can kind of relax into knowing um, that there is a, a, a pilot that is taking me home. <laughs> and it's a team of people even, not just the very spirit that I trust, but this, the very spirit within the people that I trust and within myself. So that's how we build together. You know, each of these plays off one another. The N is one, as I mentioned earlier, that I think we really get at Unity, kind of innately. It's a big part of who we are as non-judgmental. You know, and that, my sister always says that when she comes from the Lutheran Church and comes to Unity, um, she always says, oh, I always have this feeling in Unity of just nobody's judging anybody. Everybody can just come as they are. She's like this big spectrum of people, and it's just, you know, I can relax. And so I don't know why she doesn't come more often, but that's <laughs> another question for another day. <laughs> but at least for the time she comes, she can feel that, you know? And it's, isn't that lovely that that's kind of, I think that's probably how we are known in many ways, that people feel like they can come into a loving, accepting place. And I'm not saying we're not human here, that, every, you know, that there won't ever be a time somebody feels like there has been some kind of slight or judgment, but, but we do our best, right? That's a value I think we really hold together, that we really offer that kind of loving space. And, and so that can be such a gift for us, and it can be such a, a way to build trust. Elton, has anybody seen Rocket Man? Oh, do go if you're an Elton John fan. It's fabulous. And, it, you know, and, and not only to just appreciate his musical genius and sing along with all the songs we know and love and see his in amazing, fabulous costumes again. <laughs> But also, it's such a tender journey. It's such a tender journey of his life. And oh, gosh, I could cry just thinking about it. You know, he just, it was not easy. It was not easy. He did not have parents that supported him. He was very judged. Um, you know, he just was waiting and waiting for his father to hug him, and he never did. You know, it's just this sort of, on, oh, it just breaks your heart, you know? So, so when he came out to his mother that he was gay, she said he would never properly be loved. And I mean, it was just one example of many, you know? So, so there's just this sort of heartbreak after heartbreak. And, is a tip, you know, and then what does he have accessible to him as so many rock stars do, you know? Everything to fill the hole, right? Drugs and alcohol and more drugs and more alcohol and he became a sex addict and he was bulimic and he was a shopaholic and you know you name the isms and all the alcohol or the addictions he he grabbed on to all of them and there's just this powerful shift that happens when he makes a different decision and what is that powerful shift that happens for all of us it is a turn to self love it's when we turn within and we realize. I can't feel that from the outside because it's, it's, it's in here, right? It's got to come from within here. We got to find that place in us where we love ourselves enough, that we love ourselves enough to turn it around, and that's exactly what he does. So I'm sorry, spoiler alert, if you don't know his story. <laughs> Not many of you raised your hand. I heard somebody say, oh, I want to see it. So 
but but it, it's still worth seeing. It's just just fabulous. And and you know he proved his mother wrong because he is properly loved, not only from the inside, but he has a loving husband and family, and he's actually stopped touring because he wants to spend more time with his family. So. Just, you know, it, it, but it's a, it's a story of triumph. It's a story of, of finding the, the trust within ourselves and the some place to land, you know. And he had a best friend that was always there, always trustworthy, you know. So even if we just have one person, you know, we always have God. We always have the divine that we can trust on 100% any time. But even to have one person in our lives, one person in our square squad, like we talked about last week, one person that will always be there for us, that will also call us up higher, but won't judge us, you know, will love us because of our imperfections, not in spite of them. That, that's enough. That's enough. One person and the God within us to get us through anything and to buoy up the kind of trustworthy person that we can be in the world. And so it was just a really potent story to me of non-judgment and how to make your way through it. And then, of course, all the things he did to the discipline to get out of his addictions is boundaries, right? You have to start to set boundaries for yourself. And that's discipline. That's spiritual practice as a discipline. The things that we will reach for instead of reaching out to reach in. That takes time to begin to learn that impulse to reach in instead of out. Um, and all of that, that integrity to stay the path, to, to, to stay, stay clean and sober in this case, but to stay the path of self-love, to stay the, stay the path of non-judgment, not judging ourselves. I like to draw pictures when I go on, uh, especially do this when I go on spiritual retreats, just a way for spirit to come through me in that imagery and that symbolic way that I think is such a key way that spirit um, communicates. And often my drawings are very childlike that come through. So it's a lot, you know, just maybe inner child stuff or just childlike in the way that they come through. But I remember once drawing one where it was the, the um, defrocked judge. So the judge within me was being defrocked. And so there was a throne and she was falling, falling, falling to the ground. Her robes were falling, you know, <laughs> in the air. And so, you know, maybe it's sometimes for us when we realize that judgment is something that's coming up in our lives and we want to move toward a more non-judgmental place. We just have to do what we need to do to defrock the internal judge, which is usually the internalized voice of a parent, right? So we just, you know, just debunk that. We're an adult now and we don't need to carry around that heavy voice, that, that sense of judgment. We can open ourselves up and that opens up our trust in ourselves, our joy. You know, this, this is a real key to opening up our joy to move into non-judgment. It's not about not having wisdom. It's not about not, not being accountable because you remember all these work together. So we make mistakes, sure, but that's about guilt. It's not about shame, right? Guilt is, I, I apologize, I did something, I need to clean it up. Shame is it's about me. It's about my sinfulness, my badness, my, you know, and that's, that's not really where we want to be. So when that gets lit up, we do healing work there and, and free that for ourselves and come back into that place of trust of who we are and the journey we're on. And the last one is generosity. Generosity is about extending the most generous interpretation of another words and in words and actions. So it's about offering just, you know, you may think something happened or, or something did happen and then the story gets made up, right? We start telling the story of what happened and we start armoring up, right? And, and getting ready for maybe even the battle. But instead, if we could just leave all that down and just say, you know what? I don't know everything that happened here and I don't know what that person's motivations are. So I am going to extend the most generous interpretation I possibly can of their words and their actions until I can do a little fact finding and we can explore together. So that gives us that sense of just, it's a gift, isn't it? A giving of this great gift to say, I'm gonna hold you in a space of generosity. That's what spirit does for us, right? We are always held in the open arms of generosity. We are always held there no matter what happens. We can make a bazillion mistakes, and we are always held in the arms of unconditional love and generosity. And so, so we can trust in that, that there's a place to, to, to land, there's a, and that we'll always be caught. There's always 
somebody driving us home safely. And we can be in that calm space of knowing that truth every day, in every way. Ultimately, that's what it's all about, is trusting the spirit within us. The rest of it is a help to break it down into the anatomy and the elements and see how it shows up in the ways that we interact with one another and how we show up in the world and how we will be understood to be somebody who is trustworthy. So together as leaders, we build these skills. Together as leaders, we know that it's a brave walk to be this, to, to embody the sense of, of, of trust, of leadership in, in every way, to be courage, courageous enough to really say yes to this. So let's brave it together and let's also remember who's in charge. And let's do that together with our affirmation as we close out today. Together, I am braving trust every day. I trust in the God of my being to lead the way. So it is.